Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Lindsay and me today for this brief discussion on how human capital preparedness impacts capital project success. A key goal of the capital project is to achieve a state of operational readiness in time to achieve a successful startup on time and within budget. As you can see from the diagram on the screen, people, processes, and technology all work together to achieve that goal. Ultimately, another goal of every project is to reach a state of operational excellence as soon as possible after the startup. Reaching operational excellence results in achieving the highest standards in cost, performance, and quality. As you can see, again, from this diagram shown on the slide, the human capital element, people, impacts achievement of both operational readiness and operational excellence. With that in mind, we'll look at ways to prepare the human element, that is the workforce, for achieving these goals in a capital project. First of all, I'd like to discuss the capital project expectations in a little more detail. You can see from uh, the slide that's shown, there's three categories of expectations. The human element of any startup impacts both the operational readiness and excellence of a facility, and these three main factors are availability, knowledge, and flexibility. Are your people available and knowledgeable to operate the facility on day one? Bringing on the right staff in enough time and training them to safely and effectively start up and run the facility is of key importance. Flexibility becomes an important factor that both results from and contributes to the previous two factors. By ensuring the resources you have to operate the facility are able to help in multiple areas. Essentially, if your human capital is cross-trained in multiple areas early, this leads to gains in the other two factors. They will be more knowledgeable to work in all areas or to help train others, which will have impact on the overall availability of resources and how you can effectively utilize them where most needed. Given this information, let's find out the impact that the human element has if startup expectations are not met due to an unprepared workforce. You'll see on the screen a quick poll uh, that we offer regarding the hazards of an unprepared workforce. As you look at this poll, consider how many projects do you think are delayed beyond schedule? Select your response. Do you think it's 19%, 73%, 55%, 27%, 48%, or 81%? We'll allow a few moments for you to enter your answer to the poll, and then we'll look at the results. According to the recent report, Improving Project Delivery in Oil and Gas, Managing the Mega Projects, published by EY's Performance Journal, it turns out that 73% of all capital projects are delayed beyond schedule, and 64% of those run over budget. Another report cited that the number one root cause of capital project issues is people and organizations. Now, considering the results of that poll and how difficult it is to achieve success in a capital project, and also considering that the workforce is one of the primary reasons for problems in a capital project, let's consider some of the factors that contribute to these problems. Startup delays, operational errors, personnel shortages, quality losses, cost increases. Those things are all things that contribute to these delays in capital projects, which result in cost overruns as well as delays in the project startup. To avoid these hazards, you need to develop a plan to prepare your workforce. And in the next slide, you'll see uh, us elaborate on that plan. This slide shows five key considerations that should go into a plan. And the plan is important because it's the best way to mitigate the hazards of an unprepared workforce. Developing that plan will help get your human element to the state of readiness in the most efficient and the most effective way possible. In doing so, you'll realize tangible benefits that will lead to operational readiness as well as our ongoing after the startup. And some of these include those five elements that are shown on the slide. Consider safety. 
Planning in advance to prepare the workforce allows for advanced consideration of all the potential hazards. It also results in improved safety during commissioning, startup, and ongoing operations. Also, efficiency will be improved. Having a plan results in a structured process to accomplish pre-startup activities, resulting in better opportunities to achieve schedule and cost milestones. It will also make your workforce more effective. The right kind of plan will result in having skilled and knowledgeable personnel available not only for startup on day one, but also for key pre-startup and commissioning activities. It will also improve the reliability of, of the startup, and as well as ongoing operations. Incorporating equipment and process activities into the human capital development plan will result in a more reliable workforce and a more reliable process as the capital project progresses. And finally, it will also improve trust, one of those things that you don't really consider uh, in, in planning, but trust is so important in starting up a new project. Having a plan ensures that all critical aspects of the human capital development have been identified and they are addressed, resulting in greater trust in the human element to achieve the desired outcomes of the project. So with that in mind, let's look at the, at the key, three key factors that will impact your workforce. First is availability of the human element. That is the screening, hiring, and onboarding of the workforce. Ensuring that the available human capital meets standardized requirements forms the basis for the plan. Secondly, we need to consider the abilities of the human element, those things that are required to perform the job correctly. To do that, we need to identify the required knowledge and skills as well as define the role so that the workforce understands what they need to know and what they need to do to achieve success. The level of proficiency for job tasks must also be established so that the methods of attainability can be determined. This is especially important when developing a plan for a capital project in a regulated industry or a process where human performance can lead to incidents affecting personnel safety issues, environmental releases, and potentially catastrophic results. Finally, the attainability of the required uh, abilities must be addressed. So those knowledge and skills that were required, there must be a method to ensure that the workforce gains those knowledge and skills. This is commonly accomplished through training and qualification, but it also includes those things that contribute to the training and qualification program. That's things like process information, technology, job aids, human factors considerations, as well as the procedures to do the task directly. Having a plan that considers all these factors can help achieve a vertical startup. This slide that's on this, you see now shows a graph that leads to vertical startup and also shows the outcomes that would be achieved in a properly performing plan and one that's not running so well. In the case of a capital project, vertical startup refers to meeting all project objectives or reaching the state of operational readiness on day one. In essence, it means doing it right the first time so that when the project reaches startup, productive results are achieved. There are several factors that go into attaining vertical startup. A few of those include engineering, maintenance and reliability, and the human element. While it's easy to recognize the impact that good engineering coupled with well-thought-out maintenance and reliability program might have on a process at startup, sometimes we don't consider how much impact a prepared workforce has on the startup and post-startup performance. Even when we do consider it, sometimes it's really late in the, the process to get to day one, and it can cause some problems. Note the curves on the graph shown in this slide. You'll see the blue curve represents the desired state of vertical startup, where the process reaches design capacity at day one or very close to day one. So you're producing the kind of results you desire shortly after day one of startup. The red curve shows the impact of a poor startup and poor operations after startup, resulting from human element issues such as operator errors. You'll note the area between the two curves, the shaded area there, 
It represents the potential loss return on investment that could occur because of those operator errors. The loss to return on investment can be avoided by having a structured plan to address the human element development needs prior to startup, and those will help you achieve vertical startup. We'll see an example of that plan now on this next slide. This slide shows how certain elements of the capital project overlap and combine to form a progressive plan that helps achieve the desired state of operational readiness. Note that the factors that impact development of the human element begin approximately 19 months prior to startup. Starting this far in advance allows flexibility and assurance that all factors affecting human capital development are addressed. Here are a few of the considerations you'll, you'll see on this, this plan. Workforce analysis. It's important to know what knowledge, skills, and experience your workforce has and how that compares to the knowledge, skills, and experience your workforce needs. Then there's the documentation. Once the full awareness of your workforce capabilities and the gaps that they have have been identified, an essential element to ensuring your workforce has the tools they need is to process, develop that documentation that they need to process so that they can do their jobs. This documentation includes process information description, basic training, job-specific training guides and qualification programs, procedures including emergency, normal, startup, and shutdown, emergency response documentation and plans, and optimization and troubleshooting helps. All of those things are key to help the workforce develop to where they'll be operational, operationally ready on day one. Finally, training deployment. Once you have all these pieces in place, a critical step in preparing your workforce training on the development materials must be rolled out. That, that involves scheduling, conducting, and assessing to ensure that your workforce attains the knowledge and skills required to achieve operational readiness. Another key consideration involving training deployment is to allow time for remediation if necessary. Many times when these capital project plans are put in place, training the workforce is an afterthought, and some of those, some of the flexibility that comes by allowing that time is missing. So what's shown here is an ideal or preferred plan, but as most of us can attest, things are seldom ideal in a capital project. With that in mind, Lindsay will describe what is more commonly seen. Thanks, Ron. What's more commonly seen, but definitely not ideal, is what can be referred to as the just-in-time approach to workforce preparation. In this approach, as you can see on this slide, the average 19-month plan to ensuring successful operational readiness and excellence is condensed from a staggered plan to an overlapping plan that completes workforce analysis, documentation development, and training deployment very closely together and often simultaneously. This just-in-time approach is, as I mentioned before, not ideal. The condensed time timeline reduces flexibility and puts the launch at risk for additional hazards. Some of the additional obstacles that commonly occur in this just-in-time approach to workforce preparation are shown here. Unrealistic schedules being the first. When the timeline has started late, preparing the workforce for operation often becomes a critical path to safely starting up. This is one of the major obstacles that leads to either putting unrealistic expectations on resources preparing for startup, or can lead to unreliable resources, disorganization, and dysfunctional distracted teams preparing for and participating in a plant startup. It's important to know here that these obstacles can and probably will happen to some extent in both the ideal and just-in-time schedules and plans. However, the impact that these snares can cause on a just-in-time schedule is much greater. Keep in mind that the ideal schedule is staggered to help manage these obstacles and snares. So essentially, the sooner you start, the more flexibility you have. This flexibility is critical in capital projects where any schedule, schedule delays you have can result in major cost overruns. 
which is why building flexi the flexibility that Ron described in the ideal plan is of such importance. So how do you ensure success? setting yourself up for the ideal timeline, or managing your just-in-time plan. Those successful results come from the key workforce development factors of planning, communication, execution, and change management. One example of how this type of plan helps achieve operational readiness on a medium-scale project we recently completed was at a biofuels facility earlier this year. This project was started by following the ideal plan Ron explained earlier. However, due to project constraints at the site, it ended up falling more into a just-in-time for startup approach. Because the operational readiness plan was started roughly 18 months prior to the planned startup, when obstacles arose, as they always do, almost, the project team was afforded the flexibility to adjust while still completing the workforce preparation on time and under budget. In this particular example, one of our teams was tasked roughly eight months prior to startup to analyze the needs of the workforce, develop the procedural documentation, process information, and training material, and then to facilitate the actual training of a mix of experienced and inexperienced operators. Using the techniques identified here, all of these milestones were able to be completing, resulting in knowledge evaluation scores of participants rising from a 57% pretest score to a 97% post-training evaluation score. This was all accomplished 12% under budget and meeting the timeline. Ron will now share with you another example. Thanks, Lindsay, for that example. I'm gonna, another example that I'll share is a much larger scale capital project, uh, you might call it a mega project, where there are many complex factors that uh, impact an operational readiness, not the least of which was the human element, which was compounded by the use of new technology and the need to meet new regulatory requirements. In this particular project, the structured plan was developed well over a year in advance of startup and incorporated all of the key elements mentioned earlier, availability of personnel, determining the abilities uh, needed, and then how to attain those abilities as it related to the workforce. By using that structured plan and by implementing the plan far in advance of the actual startup, key milestones were met and personnel were ready to assist with pre-startup activities. In this particular case, over 100 operators were not only trained and qualified for startup, many of those operators assisted with procedure development commissioning activities, which increased their proficiency and trust prior to startup. As a result, the human element achieved a state of operational readiness well before startup. That wouldn't happen without a solid plan, without good communication, consistent execution, and tracking and managing changes. Now, let's put it all together. If, if you take a look at the diagram on the screen, there, you'll see that there are many factors that go into achieving operational readiness for a capital project. Our discussion today concentrated on the human element, which impacts several of the key areas that impact project success shown on the diagram. The circular diagram summarizes all these factors, engineering, workforce analysis, documentation and development, maintenance and reliability, training design and development, and vertical startup. These are all areas where GP strategies can help you achieve success in your capital project. In fact, GP strategies have considered all the factors and developed a concise model plan. This plan, which you see on your screen now, is what we refer to as the CAPEX, capital expansion timeline. This plan ties all the factors together. It sequences, sequences together those actionable steps to achieve success and provides advanced planning. It allows time on the schedule in the timeline to be very flexible to, so that you can address those snares and obstacles that may come up during a capital project. GP Strategies would like to offer this plan to you in a large format drawing. Here's how you can get yours. If you'd like to receive a copy of this plan, please send Ron or me an email at the address shown. We'll be happy to get you a copy right away. Thank you for joining today's us for today's topic. Now we'll be turning the presentation back over to Nick for comments and questions. All right, thank you so much, Ron and Lindsay. That was a great presentation. Um, we only have a few minutes left, uh, so just as a reminder, if you have a question, um, please be sure to enter it into the Q&A module and we'll make sure it's addressed either today or uh, in a follow-up blog post. Um, so both presenters have covered a lot in only 20 minutes.
but we still have some more to discuss here. We do have a few questions um, coming in, but before we get to that, I'd like to remind you that the recording um, and slides from today will be sent to uh, the email address that you provided within 48 hours from today. Um, and it looks like we have a few questions coming in. Uh, so I'll go with the first one. Uh, this one's for you, Ron. Um, in the ideal versus just-in-time approaches, how often do you actually see the ideal plan being used? Well, I appreciate that question, and uh, it's a great question. Uh, the truth is we don't see it being used very often. Uh, it, over, over past projects, many folks, as a matter of fact, uh, as they plan their projects, workforce development is an afterthought. But what has resulted, as you've seen through some of the documented evidence we've uh, cited early on in this presentation, is that the workforce has been an issue in delaying capital project launches. So uh, mo more and more we've seen this addressed and lately, but uh, if you look historically, you would say that this has been more of an oversight. So you see more of a just-in-time approach, less of the ideal approach. But uh, as I mentioned uh, here recently, we are seeing more of a tendency to try to get ideal, recognize the value of the workforce, and it's being implemented in that way. Lindsay, did you have anything to add? Um, I think that's good. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you guys one more, and then we can address the rest in a a follow-up blog post. Um, this, uh, this one is, how does one begin to start developing a plan on their own? Lindsay, do you want to take that or you want me to take it? I'll start. You can, you can add if you have anything. So whenever you start to develop your plan for your capital expansion, one of the, the key starting points is to create a vision for your final result. What would you like your end result to be? Once you have um, your end result in mind, you can trace backwards to actually develop, um, to actually put in place a plan to develop each factor to help you accomplish that end result. Um, one of the factors that's often left out on that plan that we discussed today is the workforce development factor. Um, the reason we've offered this, this timeline to everyone on the call is because it's something that can really help help you to develop that plan and where each factor needed for a successful startup can fall into a, um, a well-prepared or well-thought-of timeline. Do you have anything to add to that, Ron? Well, yeah, I'll add one other thing because I know we're, we're running short on time, but the, one of the key aspects of beginning is, is, is knowing that future state and looking at your realistically at your current state. Uh, one of the issues we've seen in a number of projects is that folks don't realize where people start when they when they bring their hire when they hire into the uh, the folks in that are going to be the op future operators on the the project. Uh, they don't realize what their level is going to be. So having good uh, availability definitions: what are the job roles going to be? What um, what's the standards for hiring? Sometimes uh, you've got to take folks with absolutely no experience and turn them into qualified operators by the time the project start date starts. And that requires special considerations in your workforce development plan. Okay, thanks, Ron. I actually have one more question. I think we have a minute for it, uh, and then we'll end. Um, how can an operator readiness program have an impact on green projects versus brown projects? Well, um, the Operation Readiness Program has a major impact on green projects because you're starting with essentially a, a brand new workforce. The Brown Project, in many cases, you can take some experienced workforce from other areas that can be integrated into helping train operators and even in, in be, be prepared to start that new project. But the green, uh, the green uh, project, uh, Greenfield Startup, is probably where this has the most impact. But it's valuable in both. I, I hope that answered the question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ron. Thank you both, uh, Ron Fashan and Lindsay All. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended for uh, your time and your attention. Um, we'll hope you'll join us again for our next webinar, Planning It All Out, Critical Practices to Achieve Operational Excellence. For GP Strategies, I'm Nick Morris, and everyone have a great day.